Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Tammy, and I'm an alcoholic. And I want to congratulate those who took time. Happy birthday and congratulations. That's always a really big deal. And welcome to the newcomers. And I just want to ask, does anybody know what Rule 62 is? Don't take yourself too damn seriously. And that's one of the reasons I'm standing before you today. I just want to welcome everyone and just say thank you for coming tonight. And if you're in these rooms and you are feeling hopeless, suicidal, afraid, lost, lonely, if you have no idea how you're going to sit in your seat for the rest of this meeting because all you want to do is run away, I just want to tell you that you are in the right place that I am a living witness that this program really works and that you can live a sober life. I want you to know that you have not made too many mistakes, that you have not failed too many times, that you have not committed too many crimes or relapsed too many times, that you can begin again, that you can start afresh today. It doesn't matter if you made the mistake 10 minutes ago or 10 years ago. You can begin again today. And I am a living witness. I want to fill you with hope today. The program really works. The steps really work. And so I'm just going to share with you my story. I started drinking when I was 15 and a half years old, and I instantly I loved alcohol. There was one thing my body screamed, and it was more. I wanted more. I finally felt like I was okay, like I fit in, like I was good enough. I had always felt like I didn't measure up, like I did did everything wrong, like I didn't fit in. I felt alone and isolated as a child growing up. And when I drank, I finally felt like I was okay, and I just wanted more. It wasn't long before I had attempted suicide three times. The third time was the worst time. It took them three cops to hold me down, and they were pumping my stomach, and I was screaming for them to leave me alone. I wanted to die. I was completely hopeless. I had no hope at all. My father had recently died, and all I knew was that I wanted to go wherever he was. I wanted to be with him. I was in so much pain. My father was an alcoholic heroin addict um, all during my childhood, and I grew up visiting my father in and out of prison my whole childhood. And I was completely hopeless. I just, I was born into alcoholism, drug addiction, and crime. My father started going to jail when I was a baby, and I just wanted out. I loved my dad. It did not matter what he did. I loved him and he died from a heroin overdose. And I just remember waking up in the hospital the next day thinking, what is wrong with me? I can't even kill myself right. Of course, again, I couldn't even do that right. And it was right after that that I put myself in a 30-day treatment center. And in that treatment center, I learned, they taught me that I needed to get up every day and surrender to a power greater than myself and ask God to keep me sober on a daily basis. I can tell you the God thing was really hard for me. I kind of thought maybe God existed, but if he did, he definitely didn't like me because all I had was severe storms my whole life. But I was so done with me. I was so done with everything about me. I had tried everything myself to get sober. I hated myself. It was always tomorrow I'm going to quit. Tomorrow I'm going to quit. And tomorrow would come and I could not quit. I could not stop. 
I could not stop drinking. The pain inside me was so bad, and I wanted everything to go away. I tried church. I tried counseling. I tried everything, and nothing made me better. And I knew my father had tried Alcoholics Anonymous, but he was never sober. So I didn't really have much hope for AA. But I just was so done with me, I had to just shut up and listen to what they were telling me. So I sat in the rooms, and I listened, and I started doing what was suggested to me. I got a sponsor. I started working the steps. I daily surrendered to that power greater than myself. I remember thinking, what is the use in this? Is anyone listening? Does anyone care? You know, does it really even matter if I ask for help? Because I didn't think anyone would ever be there for me. I always felt abandoned, rejected, not good enough, alone and isolated in this world. And I wanted, you know, I just wanted peace. I wanted peace more than anything. And when I listened to you guys in these rooms talk about the pain inside you, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Because I had always thought that I was alone, and I heard people talking about the things that were going on inside of me, and I realized I was not alone, and I finally felt at home in these rooms when I heard you talking about how you were dealing with life and how you were living life sober. So I just continued to show up. I had post-traumatic stress syndrome. I had nightmares all the time. I shook. I was so full of fear and anxiety. I was terrified of people. My dad had been married seven times, and I was, I underwent a lot of, um, there was a lot of fighting. You guys know what it's like. There's a lot of fighting with alcoholism and drug addiction. And I would remember being in, um, hiding in the bushes, afraid because people are trying to get us as a child and just hoping that people won't find us, running away all the time, running away. None of this I remembered before I got sober. All of a sudden, I'm having flashbacks and memories as I'm sober. And I'm trying to do life sober without turning to alcohol and drugs. And I can tell you, it was very scary Alcohol and drugs became my best friend, and I did not want to give them up. And I didn't think that I really could. I would listen to people say that they had been sober over 10 years, and I remember thinking I should just go have a drink right now because I could never stay sober that long. I can tell you that by the grace of God, I've been sober over 29 years. And that is a miracle. It really is a miracle. And I got sober young. <gasps> I was the least likely to stay sober. I was always the one who was ripping the cords off of me and going AMA. I was running away from everything. I did not want to deal with my trauma. I didn't want to deal with anything that was going on in my life. But I wanted the peace that I saw that you guys had. And I heard people talk about how working the steps. They had overcome things, and they had peace and joy, and, and I wanted that really bad. So I set out to prove that AA wouldn't work for me, and I was going to work your steps so that I could say that AA thing didn't work, but the problem is, is it really does work. <laughs> and so, you know, the step four, making a searching and fearless moral inventory, I didn't even know what that was. I lied, I cheated, I stole, and I did not feel bad about it. That was what I needed to do to take care of myself. And I got into these rooms, and I listened, and I started writing things down, and I tricked myself into doing step four and step five. I decided that I would write everything down, and by the way, step four is all those secrets that you swore you would never tell anybody, that's step four. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm definitely not doing this. <laughs> and then I just, okay, I decided I'm going to write it all down, but I'm not going to do step five and share it with somebody. So I started writing everything down, and I wrote it all down, and then I met with my sponsor, and I did step five because I was going to women's step studies, and I heard the peace and the joy and how it had actually worked in people's lives, and I wanted that. 
I was, again, I was so done with me because I had tried everything. I had a saying, I can't cope, I can't cope without the dope. And at the end, it was, I can't cope with the dope because it wasn't making it any better. It was only making it worse. Remember this saying, always worse, never better. You know, when I watched my father, he always tried to make alcohol and drugs work for him over and over. I never saw him sober. And I think by watching his life, it has helped me to stay sober because he continued to try and make alcohol and drugs work. The thing is, is I love alcohol and drugs. If it would work for me, I would relapse today. But once it no longer works for us, there's no going back. It, there's nothing fun about hospitals, institutions, and death. There's nothing fun about that. And it always gets worse, never better. So I met with my sponsor, and we did step five. And I laid it all out there. And the big book talks about finding a closed mouth person to do your step work with. And I know that that can be a really difficult thing. So I just would encourage you guys to ask your power greater than yourself, your higher power, God, whatever you want to call that power, whether it's universe, he, she, it, start where you are at and don't get caught up in, oh, I can't do that AA thing because I don't believe in so-and-so's God. Start where you are at. That's what I did. I started, I just... I just did what they told me to do. I didn't know who I was talking to. I just like, help, help me, help me, God, help me, God. And I can tell you that's still my favorite prayer today. Help me, God, because I have no idea. You know, life throws us a lot of curveballs. And so after meeting with my sponsor and finishing step five, I've moved on to step six and seven and taking a look at all of Everything, you know, looking at pride and greed and lust and jealousy and envy and insecurity and all of that, you know, and I, I didn't even know what those words meant. I had no idea what you guys were talking about. It was just little by little. I took the next baby step that you told me to take and I began to look at me. And when I got into these rooms, everything was mommy and daddy's fault. I blamed everyone and everything for the mess that my life was in. What I learned in these rooms was to take personal responsibility, to take personal accountability for my actions in everything. And I, you know, that isn't always easy, but it's much better than turning to alcohol and drugs and ending up in jails and hospitals and institutions. So I looked at everything that was going on with me, and I continued to write all of that stuff down, continued to share it with my sponsor. I went and made amends and said, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? I made amends to, I did all of my amends. And what I found was freedom in saying, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? You know, today I say that a lot. If I'm I'm human, I make mistakes, and I can say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And I learned that in these rooms. I learned to love in these rooms, and I learned to forgive in these rooms. And, you know, I was full of a lot of anxiety and fear and hatred. I was so angry, and getting past all of that was not an easy thing. You know, I did a lot of writing, writing down all of that, anger, what I was angry about, being heard. I had to be heard. I was never heard. And what I found in these rooms was unconditional love. I was surrounded by a group of women that I could get honest and genuine and real with. And I found unconditional love for them, with them. And I was able to lay out everything in my life and shine the light on all of the, all of the secrets, everything that I wanted hidden. I exposed it all and talked about it all. And I, you know, one of the things that I've learned in these rooms is that God's love is not something, it's nothing that I've done and nothing that I ever will do will cause God to love me any more or any less. He loves me unconditionally. And that love is not something that I have to earn. I don't have to do enough right things to earn that love. 
and it doesn't, you know, he's not, he's not up there making a checklist of my rights and wrongs. And, you know, I experienced unconditional love in these rooms through the women just loving me and allowing me to cry and allowing me to be heard and validating me. I found value in these rooms. And I want you to know that you have value, that you are valuable that it's not based on how many things you do right or what you did wrong, and that it's not based on your position or your title or how much money you have. None of that is where our value comes from. Today I know that my value comes from my creator, and I don't have to have circumstances around me be all perfect which I can tell you they definitely are not. <laughs> I'm living in a lot of chaos. <laughs> and, you know, but I just keep doing the next baby step, keep taking the next baby step that is in front of me. And no matter what happens in my life, I don't turn to alcohol and I don't turn to drugs because I know it's not the answer. And I just, I love the saying that we, we, ne we never quit anything. We just don't pick up today. You know, it's one day at a time. We just do this one day at a time. So I made my amends, you know, to all of the people that I needed to make amends to. And I continue on a daily basis with step 10, making that searching and fearless moral inventory and taking a, a daily inventory and being responsible for my words, my actions, and and trying with relationships, you know. I love reaching out and helping another alcoholic. That is what keeps me sober today. In difficult times, I remember this too shall pass. I know that the pain in difficult times will pass and that I don't have to drink. I don't have to drink over it today. And I love hearing the newcomers because they remind me that it still doesn't work. I was recently speaking with a woman who had relapsed over 34 years. She had 34 years of sobriety, and she relapsed. And another woman who had 28 years of sobriety, and she relapsed. And you know what? I listen, and they remind me it doesn't work. And I listen today. When I got into these rooms, I didn't listen to anybody. I thought I knew everything, and I was rebellious. As alcoholics, we are rebellious by nature. We, you know, somebody tells us to do something and we want to do the opposite. That is just our nature. We are rebellious, you know, and that's, and I, I when I'm working with newcomers, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to share with you. This is how I have stayed sober one day at a time. This is how I have stayed sober. So another thing that I've learned and I've always taught my kids this is that to judge no one. You have no idea what another person has been through. You have no idea. And so I, you know, I always tell them, judge no one, because each of us has our stories, and we have no idea what anyone has ever been through. They um, went on a school retreat, and they found that the kids on the retreat started crying and opening up and sharing what had gone on in their lives and all this trauma that they had had to endure. And, you know, they, my kids were, were shocked, you know, they had no idea that these kids had to endure so much trauma. And each one of us in here, we have our stories, each one of us. And so, you know, I just love to encourage people to judge no one because we don't know what any of us has ever been through. And I know that, you know, when you're looking for someone that you trust, that you can open up to, someone who's not going to share your secrets, some that closed mouth person, look for someone who's not going to judge you, because that is very important when you're laying it all out there. I can tell you it's a gift. It's a freedom through being honest and genuine and transparent. I was set free. None of that stuff has a hold on me anymore. And I, you know, just through shining the light on it, it's just, it doesn't have a hold on me and I don't have to run from things. I can talk about things, you know, I can just talk about them openly because it loses power when I begin to talk about it. Um, so back before I got, um, 
before I went into the rehab, I had a boyfriend at the time, and he kept saying, "You need." we drank and used together, we partied together, and he kept saying, you need to get help, you need to get help, and I was like, of course, I was the perfect alcoholic, no, it's not me, it's all you, and, <laughs> and I was in denial, you know, denial is a really big thing, so if you're in denial, you know, you, you won't know it, but anything will be the problem except for your drugs and alcohol. You know, and I did not want to give that up, so I kept saying, no, I was not the problem, and through, um, we just, we were done. We were just so done with each other, and so after that, I, at putting myself into rehab, he decided that he wanted to do the, um, the family care with me in rehab, and he came to all of the stuff, and um, supported me in my um, in my sobriety, went to meetings with me, and but didn't think that he had a problem. And we relapsed together one night. Well, it was a relapse for me. I stayed sober for six months. And actually, he had stayed sober too, but it, he w didn't have a problem. He was just doing it for me. And... Um, <laughs> And then we relapsed one night. It was the anniversary of my father's death. And in that one night, I realized I do not want to go back to this at all cost. And in that one night, he realized that, oh, my gosh, you almost died. And here I am doing drugs and alcohol with you. Obviously, I have a problem, too. So we both decided we would go back to AA the very next day, introduce ourselves as newcomers, and start again. And that boyfriend became my husband. That boyfriend is my husband today. We are still married. We have the same sobriety date. We've both been sober over 29 years. However, in the last seven years, he uh, almost died in the hospital, has, um, has been in, um, spent many multiple surgeries that went wrong and has dealt with chronic pain and has um, had to be on pain pills for his pain. And uh, today um, he is, he was in the emergency room today and he said, honey, I'm just giving you more to talk about. <laughs> Because he was getting morphine today, and I got to talk about being sober. <laughs> but I can tell you, we spent probably, we have two boys. Our boys are um, 19 and 23. We've raised our kids in sobriety. The last seven years has been very difficult, but we just continue to put one foot in front of the, another and just do the next indicated thing. Um, so, you know, with his, with his illnesses, it was multiple surgeries and pain pills, and we spent probably at least five years in the bed going to different doctors, taking him to um, see different um, rehab specialists, multiple doctors, and at the same time, his business shut down. I had been a stay-at-home mom, and so... We had a lot that we were dealing with. I was raising, teen, we were raising teenage boys at the same time. But I can tell you, we had so many good times, and we've had a lot of really difficult times, too. And, you know, I just keep staying sober no matter what, no matter what goes on in my life, through the hard times, through the difficult times. We had so many fun times. We traveled a lot. Our kids had the best childhood, which was a really a huge gift for me because I got to watch them have a really good childhood. And they would tell you that, too, that they, you know, experienced that. They've also experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of life things in the last seven years, you know. And we've all, we're a family that is learning through our mistakes but there's two things I always tell my kids. I love you, and I'm proud of you. Because no matter what goes on, they keep getting back up. They don't give up. They just keep giving, getting up and trying again. And that's what I want to encourage you guys. It doesn't matter how many times you've relapsed. It doesn't matter how many crimes you've committed. 
it doesn't matter the mistakes that you've made, just get up and begin again, because we all fail. We're all human. We all make mistakes. You know, I learned to love and I learned to forgive in these rooms. And, you know, I've been able to, I genuinely loved, it didn't matter what my dad did. I loved him, even though he was, there were so many painful things that he did to me because of his addiction and so many things that went wrong. But I was able, I w- and I was angry and blamed him in the beginning of my sobriety. But I can tell you I've had a complete perspective change through working the steps. And even within the last couple of years, I've had things happen to me that are great stories that I would love to someday tell, but I have had a complete perspective change. And I see things completely different. And I I understand more how my dad didn't get sober than I understand how I've stayed sober. Because life is crazy. Life throws you so many curveballs, and it gets crazy. And there's a lot of painful things that we have to walk through. And, you know, doing it sober through these rooms, we can't do it alone. We need each other. This is the WE program. We learn through our connection. We need that connection with each other. You know, just that connection of being together and talking about what's going on and learning to communicate. I, you know, my, I would have told you when I was newly sober, I would have told you, I don't need anybody. It doesn't matter what happened in my childhood. It doesn't matter what happened with my mom and my dad. I don't need anybody. I pushed everybody away and my walls were so high. I couldn't talk. I just sat and listened. And, you know, I was so used to turning to alcohol and drugs. All of a sudden I'm sober and all of these emotions are coming, coming up for me and I'm feeling everything. And I, I wanted to run so bad from that. I remember calling my sponsor and just saying, what is wrong with me? I cannot be at work and having a meltdown. Like I need you to do something here. (laughs) And she told me something that really helped me, and I still carry it with me and use it today. And she told me that I needed to deal with my emotions in an appropriate place so that it didn't come up in inappropriate places. And that I began to do. I set appointments with myself to enter that pain. And I can tell you, it was not easy. It was not easy, but through being willing to look at that, what happens is it all comes up, and then... Eventually, eventually you're done. You don't care anymore. You've talked about it. You've written about it. You've shared about it. You don't care anymore. It doesn't, I'm not angry about it anymore. I'm not, I have love and forgiveness and I don't, I'm just like done. I I see it from a completely different perspective. And, you know, I, I, I genuinely love people today. I really love people. I love reaching out and helping people. You guys keep me sober today, you know, because I've walked this journey and I could not have done it without you. When I got into these rooms, I hated people. I was scared. I was afraid of people. I was afraid to let anybody close because really what I needed was I needed friendship and I needed love and acceptance. And I couldn't say that. I couldn't tell you that because I was so afraid that you wouldn't be there for me, that I wouldn't be enough, that I wouldn't measure up, that I wouldn't be good enough. And, and you know, today I can say I need your friendship. I need your love and acceptance. And I genuinely love my parents. You know, it, it's been said to those people that you're angry at, that you are really angry at, if you can just imagine, and for me, you know, imagining like my dad, my parents, you know, they're people too. They were kids too. They, they were young boys, young girls, and, and they had hopes and dreams and fears and failures and mistakes. And they had all their trauma they were trying to deal with. And they were young when they had kids. And, you know, today I, I know that they did the best they could. They did the best they could, and I, I've been able to sit with my mom and say, what was it like for you? I've been able to hear her and listen to her perspective, and I learned that in these rooms, to listen to another person's perspective, that it's not, because everything was about me. 
It was everything was about me and my pain when I got here, and I was selfish and self-centered, and I didn't think about you. I didn't care about like going doing acts of service or, you know, that to me. I didn't care about that. I didn't care about helping someone. I was like, I needed help. I needed somebody to do something for me. And what I found was through working the steps, I began to get healed. I had all this poison inside my soul. And and this through working the steps, it began to heal my soul one day at a time, slowly. It was very slowly, you know, because you're surrounded with people and you're not really sure who you can trust and who you can really open up to. And, you know, um, just finding those people that you can be real and honest and genuine with through and be transparent is a huge thing. I got set free through, through my willingness to be honest. I got set free. And I can be honest today, and I have people that I can share, you know, I'm struggling with this today. This is really hard for me today. And 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 just be genuine and honest with them and say, you know, I need a different perspective on this situation. What And being able to, you know, stay in relationships, to listen. You know, a lot of my friends got married in sobriety. Uh, I'm the only one that stayed married. What I found out is you got to get comfortable not getting your way a lot. <laughs> and, um, you know, I kind of learned to make sacrifices in these rooms. You know, I learned to sacrifice and, and listen to the other person's perspective. You know, um, sitting with my husband and hearing his perspective on something when I think I'm I'm right. I'm right. You know, and just and listening to his perspective and my kids and listening to their perspective that all of that is new for me. But I've learned to communicate in these rooms, to have relationships that last, to, you know, to have to be a friend, to reach out and be loving and kind and to be there for someone else and and to not think about myself. I love um, helping alcoholics today. I'm involved with H&I, and, and, you know, I love being at hospitals and institutions because that's where it all started for me, you know, and I, I never got a DUI yet. I never went to jail yet, but those are yets for me. I know that if I pick up today, that that could happen to me instantly, and, you know, I visited enough family members there. Visiting my father there was enough for me. Memories of visiting my father flooded me in early recovery, and I started having memories of, you know, visiting him at at the jail, talking to him on the phone, and then also in the maximum security, being a little girl and going through the gates, multiple gates, and um, visiting my father at the maximum security place. And I can tell you, I wanted to run from all that. I just, I did not, I wanted alcohol and drugs. And I did not turn to alcohol and drugs. And I am a living witness that if you face those things that you want to run from, if you face them, what happens is you get set free from them. And you have a completely different perspective. And today I have peace and joy. I sleep really well. And it's not based on my circumstances. I don't have to have everything around me going perfect. You know, I can trust that there, that, I don't understand a lot. There's one thing that I know and that I've found. I, I know, you know, I've spent a lot of time on step three and step 11. And I realize that the more that I know, the more I realize I don't know. I have no idea, you know, but I know that I should be, I should be dead. I should be addicted to drugs. I should be living on the streets, anything but sober for 29 years. That is a power greater than myself that has kept me sober on a daily basis. And so I I want you to know that you have value today, that you are valuable, and that your value does not come from people, places, things, situations. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made, how many times you've failed. You are valuable. I love the saying, you will never do anything in this world without courage. It is the greatest quality of the mind next to honor. This program takes courage, and each one of you has courage. You can do it. 
You know, I am a living witness that it really works and that you can do it one day at a time by reaching out, helping another alcoholic, and just continuing to work the steps. They really do work. And I just, you know, I, does anybody have any questions? I really have. Thank you. <laughs> How much time do I have? Left? Oh, I have left one. I love sharing my experience, strength, and hope with you guys. I love you. I want you to know that there's so much hope in these rooms. I hope I have filled you with hope today. I would love to talk with you. I genuinely love you. If no one has told you that you are valuable and you are loved, I am telling you that now, that you are valuable and you are loved. And it, reach out. Don't try and do this alone. Reach out if you are feeling suicidal, hopeless. Reach out because we are here for you. And I love you guys, and thank you for letting me share my experience, strength, and hope. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.